I was asked to speak about Tim Keller's relationship to neo-Calvinism. Um, for those of you who are unfamiliar with neo-Calvinism, um, it's maybe a strange thing to present in the Netherlands because it comes from here, but um, for some people maybe it's new. Neo-Calvinism is a branch of the Reformed tradition that began here a hundred years ago or so in the Netherlands through theologians like, and I must say names on Holland's uitspreken, Abraham Kuyper and Herman Bavink. In English, we call them Abraham Kuyper and Herman Bavink. And there, theirs was a theological tradition that tried to articulate a holistic vision of the historic Reformed faith in their own late modern Western culture. So what was Tim's relationship to that tradition? 11 years ago, he published the book, Center Church. Um, Marco just mentioned it, and Stefan mentioned it in his talk as well. Um, Center Church is a book that provided Tim's vision of a gospel movement in cities, and it has been very influential in many lands and cities since its publication. Um, it, it was published in Dutch in 2014. Uh, you can buy it at the back there, Centrum Kerk, het Evangelie Midden in je stad. Uh, if you haven't read it, it's worth reading. Now, in this book, and this is a really important thing to understand for the rest of what I'm going to say, so retain this. Um, in this book, he spelled out how the doctrinal foundation of a church gives rise to a particular theological vision, which is a set of intuitions, sensibilities, that guide how a church exists in its cultural surrounds. And that theological vision is then something that takes us to a third thing, which is expression of ministry. So these three things are really important for the book. Doctrinal foundation, theological vision, ministry expression. Now, thanks to Colin's new book on Tim and his spiritual and intellectual formation, we now have a much better impression of how Tim's thought developed across his lifetime. The young students at Bucknell University reading existentialist philosophers and whatever Christian books he could find um, wasn't the same thinker who published The Reason for God when he was 57 or 58. Tim's thought developed. And if you want to understand the range of his development and try to find a text where we can identify something like a mature expression of Tim's theology, his development in a stable form, Center Church is probably as good a place to look as any. Um, in 2013, not long after Center Church was released, I had an email conversation with Tim where I asked him, where I should look to find an expression of his theology like that, a stable, mature expression. And uh, theology in his own voice as well. The thing that I asked him about was something that we've heard about from a few speakers, that Tim synthesized lots of different figures and popularized the people he was reading. But I asked him, where can I go to hear Tim Keller's own theological voice? And he said, I should read Center Church. And in his email, he said, this is the only place that I lay out an extensive biblical and theological basis for my ministry. So initially, at least, Center Church seems like a good anchor point in talking about Tim's relationship to neo-Calvinism. Now, if you were to use Center Church like that, this is maybe the kind of answer you would sketch to the question, what was Tim's relationship to neo-Calvinism? This, this kind of answer. In Center Church, the labels neo-Calvinist and the related word Kuyperian crop up explicitly at one point in the book, and that is when Tim discusses theologies of Christ and culture. This is the part of the book where he deals with cultural engagement. But when he discusses neo-Calvinism and Kuyperianism there, in models of Christ and culture, he does so in quite a distant way. He holds them at arm's length and talks about them, but not as things that he identifies himself with in a strong, explicit way. Now, 
when you, and this is why I mentioned that it's really important to uh, remember the doctrinal foundation, theological vision, ministry expression structure, okay, this pattern of thought in the book. When he moves from doctrinal foundation to theological vision to ministry expression in the whole sweep of the book, the labels neo-Calvinist and Kuyperian make a cameo appearance. They enter the stage for one moment in center church, but they seem to leave the stage quite quickly. And that's because, in part, he needed to cover those words in order to give a comprehensive account of the Christ and culture paradigms. So there he's writing about um, transformationalism as one of these paradigms for how we relate Christ and culture. And his summary of the transformationalist's view of Christ and culture needed to refer to the American reception of Kuiper. But in center church, he doesn't identify himself explicitly as Kuyperian or as neo-Calvinist. So those terms are part of a much bigger discussion where he argues that all of the models are right and all of the models are wrong. Okay, so that's this bigger statement that also includes neo-Calvinism and Kuyperianism. He could glean insights from neo-Calvinism, but at the surface level at least, when we think of the kind of picture that Tim painted in Center Church, um, neo-Calvinist and Kuyperian are in one corner of the painting, but um, the frame around the picture itself isn't labeled neo-Calvinist. And the, the painter, the paintbrush, um, don't seem to be labeled neo-Calvinist either. Now, if we take that viewpoint from Tim Keller in 2012 from Center Church, that perspective on neo-Calvinism might seem surprising if you have also followed things Tim said and did and wrote after Center Church up to, um, up to, to this year. Um, it might make you wonder, actually, if Center Church really is reliable as a, a stable reflection of his mature theology, because he goes on to do a lot to promote neo-Calvinism in the years after Center Church. If you follow, um, for example, Tim's, uh, the things Tim would tweet about to his huge global audience, between 2014 and 2019, he only tweeted six times about either Herman Bavinck or his nephew, the missiologist Johann Hermann Bavinck. But particularly from 2020 onwards, the volume of his tweets about neo-Calvinism, the Bavincks really increases um, exponentially. It, it's, it's a dramatic change. And over the last couple of years, um, he did more than maybe anyone else in the world to champion neo-Calvinism. In 2020, he called Hermann Bavinck, and I quote him here, the greatest reformed theologian of the 20th century. And he wrote that when it comes to theologians that contemporary church leaders should be reading, I don't know of, an, of a more important one than Hermann Bavinck. He said that in 2020. In 2022, Tim was a guest on Grace in Common, which is a podcast on neo-Calvinism that I co-host with Marina de Jong, pastor in the Osterpark Kirk in Amsterdam, uh, so a, a Nederlander, um, Corey Brock, an American theologian who's a pastor in Edinburgh, and Grace Utanto, an Indonesian theologian who's a theology professor in the United States. So it's Lecker International. Okay? Um, it's our... Yeah, that's the, the, the unique selling point of our podcast is that you'll hear people talking about neo-Calvinism from a range of different places in the world. And on our podcast, when we interviewed him on neo-Calvinism, on his relationship to it, he identified himself in these words, that he is, I quote him, a neo-Calvinist first, and as a close second, a revivalist, pietist, evangelist, and thirdly, a doctrinalist. That's Tim Keller, 2022. In 2023, his final article for Gospel and Life was a creative missiological application of things that he had read in Abraham Kuyper's book, Pro Reggae. And then later that year, shortly before his passing, his final publication was a foreword to the first English translation of J.H. Bavinck's book, 
persoonlijkheid en wereldbeschouwing, personality and worldview. And it's worth noting that as far as I'm aware, his first posthumous publication will be a chapter on neo-Calvinism and pastoral ministry in the TNT Clark Handbook of Neo-Calvinism, edited by Corey Brock and Gracie Tanto. And in that chapter, he reflects on the importance of neo-Calvinism to his ministry at Redeemer Presbyterian Church, precisely the ministry that he describes in Center Church. And that's where he describes his primary theological identity in that ministry as neo-Calvinist. So I've presented you with a riddle. Um, how do we move from the Center Church era Tim Keller in 2012, who used the words neo-Calvinist and Kuyperian with some distance, how do we move from that to the eventual Tim Keller who champions neo-Calvinism to a global audience and says that his ministry at Redeemer, as described in Centre Church, was first and foremost a neo-Calvinist ministry? Does the move from Centre Church to neo-Calvinist first represent a dramatic shift in Tim's thinking um, in this final decade, or should we in interpret that difference in some other way? For example, was he already following a neo-Calvinistic trajectory when he wrote Centre Church, but that only reached full bloom later in his life? These are important questions that also emerge from Colin Hansen's book on Tim's spiritual and intellectual formation. Hansen writes about how a young student at Gordon-Conwell, a theological seminary, Tim Keller was taught by Roger Nicole, a French-Swiss Reformed Baptist, who got him to read Bavinck's book, A Reasonable Faith, uh, in Dutch it's Machnalia Dei. And all of Louis Burkhoff's systematic theology, which is um, very heavily um, indebted to Bavinck's Gereformeerde Dogmatiek. Um, at Garden Conwell, the young Tim Keller was exposed to what Hansen calls continental neo-Calvinism, and that turned Tim, as a, as a young theology student, away from an Anglo-style common-sense realism, and it grounded him in a presuppositional way of approaching questions of faith and unbelief, culture, apologetics, evangelism, and worldview. Hansen also argues that the student here at Tim Keller was also critical of some defects that he saw in neo-Calvinism, that it wasn't um, focused enough on the church and also that it wasn't evangelistic enough. But after that, in Colin's book, Neo-Calvinism, explicit Neo-Calvinism um, drops out of the narrative until we move into Tim's later years when it comes back explicitly with a bang in the, the things that, champion, uh, that, that Tim championed in particular, uh, the Bavinks. Now, in this talk, then, I'm asking about what happened between these two things, between this brief introduction to continental neo-Calvinism at Gordon Conwell as a student, and then Tim's much later identification of himself as a neo-Calvinist. And the way that I want to do that is actually by focusing on center church as a middle point. Um, now, that might seem like a puzzling move, because I introduced Center Church as a book where he discussed the term neo-Calvinist and Kuyperian, but he holds them at, at arm's length. They're distant terms. But I think that a close, careful reading of Center Church helps us make some sense of Tim's relationship to neo-Calvinism before and after Center Church. Now, to see that, we need to pay attention to two things. One is the kind of neo-Calvinism and Kuyperian theology that Tim presented explicitly in Center Church. And the other thing is the kind of theology that permeates Center Church from cover to cover, which I will argue is implicitly deeply influenced by neo-Calvinism. Okay, so I'm really asking you to think about a difference between explicit neo-Calvinism and implicit neo-Calvinism in Center Church. And I want to make a case that Center Church itself is a book that handles two kinds of neo-Calvinist thought and that does so in two quite different ways then. Explicitly at one point, it deals with an American branch of the neo-Calvinist tradition that explicitly called itself Kuyperian and neo-Calvinist. But also implicitly, 
many of the books repeated source of inspiration, not all of them, but many of them are theologically inexplicable apart from neo-Calvinism. So in Centre Church, you have a couple of Dutch neo-Calvinists, Herman Bavink and Gerhardus Voss, and they're only mentioned briefly in Centre Church, especially if you compare them to the, the attention, for example, that Tim gave to Jonathan Edwards. We could compare him. But the reality is that without Herman Bavink, we have no Gerhardus Voss. Without Gerhardus Voss, we have no Meredith Klein or Harvey Kahn or Ed Clowney. And without Klein, Clowney, and um, Kahn, we have no Tim Keller. In terms of degrees of separation, to go from Tim Keller to Herman Bavink, we're only talking about four degrees, and actually in history, quite a short space of time. Nowadays, when we try to imagine the reception of neo-Calvinism outside the Netherlands, um, often we still think that neo-Calvinism only really began to impact the, the non-Dutch world when Bavink's Gerefemirde Dogmatiek became reformed dogmatics and, but from 2003 to 2008, and that's when neo-Calvinism um, crossed the North Sea and the Atlantic. Uh, but we think far less, um, I, I think anyway, um, about how neo-Calvinism actually followed its own path particularly in North America throughout the 20th century, mostly through the influence of Gerhardus Voss, who is now probably almost entirely unknown to, uh, to Dutch Christians today. Um, George Harink um, has written about him as the American Bavink, and that's a really helpful way to frame um, who he was and what he was like. In our day, when we imagine lists of important 20th century neo-Calvinist theologians, instinctively, I think a lot of us are looking for Dutch names. And that tendency means that we overlook, um, particularly among Gerhardus Voss's 20th century American disciples, we overlook names like Clowney and Kahn and Klein. Um, theologians whose deep theological intuitions were profoundly neo-Calvinistic. But if we learn to look for American theologians in that century who were neo-Calvinistic in nature, if not in name, Center Church starts to read like a very different book. So I want you to, uh, I want to ask you to reimagine, to revisit Center Church through that lens and think about these two kinds of American neo-Calvinisms, one implicit and the other explicit. Now, as I said before, when Tim dealt explicitly with neo-Calvinism in center church, it was when he was describing the transformationalist model of Christ and culture. So there he describes a, a tradition that, and I quote him here, engages with culture largely through an emphasis on Christians pursuing their vocations from a Christian worldview and thereby changing culture, end quote. Where did the transformationalist model of Christ and culture come from? Tim writes this. This model is heavily indebted to the work and thought of the Dutch theologian and political leader, Abraham Kuyper. At that point, um, Tim identifies two important insights um, in Kuyper's thought um, that then shape transformationalism. Insight number one, Christians should be intentionally Christian in all that we do. Our faith is Catholic, a faith for all of life. Insight number two, by being intentionally Christian in all of life, Christians have a transformative impact on their cultures. And these, for Tim, are the most basic building blocks for transformationalism simpliciter. Now, from then on, Tim moves to describing the reception of Kuiper's basic insights here in the Netherlands across the Atlantic in North America. So the underlying question is, how did Americans work with those basic building blocks? How were Kuiper's insights enculturated in North America? And so he guides the reader through different branches of the American reception of Kuiper. This includes figures like Francis Schaeffer and Chuck Colson and their influence on the American religious right in popularizing the notion of worldview amongst conservative American Christians. In Tim's analysis, American Kuyperianism gravitated towards conservative political philosophy. 
He then describes Christian reconstructionism and theonomy as as a distinctive branch of the American reception of Kuiper. But then he moves to describe a very different group, a group that Tim labels the neo-Calvinists. Now, in 2012, he was not using neo-Calvinist and Kuiperian as synonyms. They were not interchangeable for him. Who then were the neo-Calvinists? And this is Tim describing Americans in his own lifetime. Whereas the Kuiperians gravitated towards socially conservative political ideals, Tim wrote the following as an extended description of the neo-Calvinists. The neo-Calvinists are center-left in their politics, seeing a progressive tax structure, strong labor unions, and more centralized economies as appropriate expressions of the biblical principles of justice. The neo-Calvinists speak of principled pluralism, the belief that Christians in government should seek principles of justice that can be recognized as such by non-believers because of natural revelation or common grace. And yet these principles clearly align with biblical principles as well. Okay. Tim's quote on the neo-Calvinists. At this point, the main difference that he presented between Kuyperian and neo-Calvinist seems to reflect the reception of Kuyper's basic ideas, Kuyper's theological foundation, or doctrinal foundation, on the American right, Kuyperian, and on the American left, neo-Calvinist. Earlier on in the chapter, for example, Tim identified the progressive neo-Calvinists as people who were bemused by how Kuyper, their intellectual hero, had now become the basis for much of the Christian right in the United States. Now, at this point, Tim was being the clear-headed analyst, and Colin describes him like this uh, really well in the, in the book, that Tim was, was able to soar above the things he described and talk about them with this kind of distance. Um, Tim had the ability to present a detailed, large picture, but where Tim is very much in control as the painter, and he's not so much part of the painting. And at that point in center church, he's describing Kuyperian and neo-Calvinist in that way. He's not trying to paint his own theological identity. Now, if you think about his analysis of the, the American receptions of basic ideas from Kuyper, and think about it within this, the structure of center church, okay, which I ask you to remember, from doctrinal foundation to theological vision to ministry expression, when we think about that structure, and then use that to look at what he writes about American, um, the American reception of Kuiper, we can see that Tim was sympathetic to Kuiper's own doctrinal foundation. Okay, so there's, there's affirmation there of the need to be Christian in all of life and the effect of being Christian in all of life on culture around us. And then you can see that these core doctrines, foundational doctrines, filter through into an Americanized theological vision of those ideas, based on those ideas. And that transformationalist theological vision then leads to different American expressions of that theological vision. I don't think that I'm reading this three-part structure onto what he writes at, at this point in Center Church. I think that clearly he identifies different American expressions of Kuiper's legacy. You see this in how he writes about the difference between Christian reconstructionists and the people that Tim labels progressive neo-Calvinists. Those are very different end expressions that begin with the same idea. Um, he also identified what he called strategies of engagement amongst these American inheritors of Kuiper. And the strategy engagement, I think, is what he means by theological vision. And the difference between Kuyperian and neo-Calvinist theological visions or strategies of engagement here for Tim is that the, on the right, the American Kuyperians want to transform culture by taking control of its political structure. So you hold the shape of society to make it Christianized. Um, so you, you Christianize it almost from the outside by controlling its structure. Whereas the American neo-Calvinists have a different vision of how to transform culture, which is that you grow um, educated Christians, holistically educated Christians within the culture. So you change it from the inside through Christian education. So we can see direct 
equivalence to ministry expression and theological vision. And then as he's moving through all of this, he also starts to describe theological difference between the Neo-Calvinists and the Kuyperians. This is doctrinal foundation. And he identifies that the two have different doctrinal foundations. So he writes this. One of the main differences between the neo-Calvinists and the religious right um, has to do with neo-Calvinists' belief that Christians do not rely on the Bible alone when seeking guidance regarding business, art, and vocation. They teach that we can discern many of God's intentions for our life in the world by looking at creation, at general revelation. In other words, while neo-Calvinists believe there is a distinctively Christian way to carry out our cultural activity, they believe non-Christians can intuitively discern much of how God wants humans to live in culture. And then Tim adds a statement of approval for the neo-Calvinist uh, doctrinal foundation. He writes, I believe this view helps neo-Calvinists make common cause with non-believers and adopt a far less combative stance in the public sphere. Now, in Center Church, Tim wrote about American Kuyperian and American Neo-Calvinist seemingly at a distance. And as I said, you know, that more distance handling is part of a big argument that there is a grain of truth in all of the Christ and culture paradigms. In a sense, they are all right and they are all wrong. In that bigger picture, Tim was trying to synthesize these different paradigms for Christ and culture into a holistic unit. Um, for which reason he does not closely identify himself with any of them. And that also includes this Kuiper-inspired transformationalism. Now, apart from that handling of distinctly American receptions of Kuiper, Center Church um, mentions two first-generation Dutch neo-Calvinists very briefly. Um, and I've mentioned their names already. Herman Bavink is mentioned twice for the idea that grace restores nature. And Gerhardus Voss is discussed at one point for his view that the kingdom of God primarily operates in the church um, and that it does not coerce the culture around it. But Bavink and Voss make these brief cameo appearances also under the, the umbrella of transformationalism. Tim cited them approvingly on those particular insights. So these fit under the doctrinal foundation idea. He, he approves their doctrinal foundations in Bavink and Voss. But he does that without, um, without jumping onto the American ship that sails under the neo-Calvinist flag. Okay, Tim did not do that in Center Church. But if you understand how his thought works in Center Church, the fact that he didn't fly under the American neo-Calvinist flag or the American Kuyperian flag is not surprising. He was able to find common ground with Kuiper's basic building blocks, the doctrinal foundation, and also with Bavink and Voss on doctrinal foundation. He did not share the theological vision of some of Kuiper's American inheritors, theonomists, an obvious example, but he did appreciate um, the, the ministry expression of some of Kuiper's inheritors in America, but that's the neo-Calvinists, not the Kuyperians. Um, in that the neo-Calvinists want to inhabit culture persuasively, non-combatively, non-coercively. So if we're starting to think about doctrinal foundation, theological vision, ministry expression, we already have in center church two of these three things being approved by Tim. Um, in the doctrinal foundation and in at least one kind of American neo-Calvinist ministry expression, all that's lacking in center church is approval um, or, or sympathy with theological vision in the middle. And if you remember, the theological vision he identified in Center Church was Kuyperians want to control the, the society politically. Neo-Calvinists want to transform the society um, by, through Christian education. But we can update Center Church um, with, with the, 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 the renewal of the Christian mind project that Tim developed after, where he's very much expressing this kind of neo-Calvinist theological vision for how you transform the culture. So if you judge, judge it by these three key ideas in Center Church, although Tim didn't call himself a neo-Calvinist in that book, and although he handled those who did identify themselves as American neo-Calvinists with a careful kind of distance, it is not the case that he rejected it. At the very least, the sort of American Kuiper reception that he liked was a kindred spirit to the project that he developed in Center Church. 
We can say at least that much about his relationship towards Americans who were explicitly working with a Dutch neo-Calvinist legacy. But then we have to ask a different question, not about those who are explicitly neo-Calvinist, but those who are implicitly so. How did, uh, what about the American theologians who didn't use those labels explicitly, but whose work was also, and whose thought was also, an American reception of Dutch ideas? In Center Church, um, the most important theologian um, in shaping Tim's view of the gospel understood contextually was Harvey Kahn. The most important theologian in shaping his view of biblical theology applied to the ministry of the church was Ed Clowney. Um, and Clowney was also um, inestimably important in teaching Tim how to preach Christ from all of scripture. But where did Kahn and Clowney get their ideas? They were both theological disciples of Gerhardus Voss, a Dutch neo-Calvinist who moved to America as a teenager. Um, I mentioned already that George Harink calls Voss the American Bavink. The Voss and Bavink families had extremely close connections, both rooted in the Afscheiding of 1834. Um, Voss himself was a close friend of, of Herman Bavink. Um, Voss's career in the United States was spent first teaching in Grand Rapids, very much in Dutch America, uh, Dutch-speaking Dutch America at that point. Um, where he was quite isolated from English-speaking Presbyterian America. And then Voss moved to Princeton Seminary, um, where he brought this Dutch Reformed approach to how to read Christ, or how to see Christ in all of Scripture, uh, where he brought that to an English-speaking American Presbyterian audience. Now, what's often forgotten about Voss is that his deeply neo-Calvinistic approach to biblical hermeneutics was part of a bigger theological package. In Dutch America, Voss taught dogmatics. Voss even wrote his own reform dogmatics. Also, unsurprisingly, a very neo-Calvinistic work. And his dogmatics and his biblical theology uh, were interconnected. I have a PhD student in Edinburgh, um, a, a Chinese Malaysian New Zealander, this is how broadly neo-Calvinism is spread, who's just about to defend a PhD thesis that shows us just how neo-Calvinistic Voss really was. Um, so Voss took that neo-Calvinist package into a Presbyterian setting and had a major impact in reaching Presbyterian students, but what he reached them with was neo-Calvinist theology. His American disciples might not have worn that label explicitly, but implicitly, how they thought about scripture, culture, theology, philosophy, apologetics, ministry, all of those things were inexplicable without the neo-Calvinism of their Dutch mentor. Now, the point I'm trying to make is that in Center Church, the explicit engagement with two streams of American Kuiper reception is not the whole story of the book's interaction with neo-Calvinism. At one level, it offers that distanced perspective on those American developments, but at another level, throughout, the book assumes a different neo-Calvinist perspective, inherited from Clowney and Kahn and also Meredith Klein, who inherited it from Voss, who developed it with Herman Bavink and Abraham Kuiper. So in that regard, on some of the most important theological foundations, Center Church is a profoundly, implicitly neo-Calvinistic book, but it's a different stream of neo-Calvinism to the American forms that Tim dealt with explicitly. So how does that help us answer the big question on how we should move from the early Tim Keller reading Machnalia Day at seminary to the mature Tim Keller um, who promoted neo-Calvinism so enthusiastically? Um, what does neo-Calvinism have to do with these many years in between? Well, when Tim came on Grace in Common, we asked him that question. And when we asked him, he started to talk about another one of his Gordon Conwell professors, another, uh, maybe we could call him an, an implicit neo-Calvinist, um, whose works feature at various points in Center Church. And that was the Old Testament scholar, Meredith Klein. Meredith Klein made Tim, as a student, made Tim read everything that Voss had published in English, or that had been translated into English. And Tim said, in effect, that while there were other places in America where Christians labeled themselves neo-Calvinist, and nobody would have called Gordon Conwell Theological Seminary a neo-Calvinist seminary, um, he said that Gordon Conwell um, gave him what he called a different door into neo-Calvinism because of the emphasis there on reading neo-Calvinist sources. 
And when we view him in that way, his seminary education grounded him in a particular form of neo-Calvinism without telling him explicitly that those sources all happened to be part of a tradition. And actually, when he started to tell us about this, um, he then took us back to before Gordon Conwell, when he was a student at Bucknell University, and he read a book by a, a Dutchman, um, Hans Rokmaker. Um, uh, the title of the book escapes me. It's, it's um, uh, the, the Death of Art and Modern Culture. Um, you know the book I mean. So some. Yes, thank you, Val. Um, so he read this book um, by this neo-Calvinist art historian, which blew his young mind because of the way that it presented Christianity as holistic, as a faith for all of life, as a faith that didn't just show you how to know that you're right with God, but actually where theology was relevant to everything, how you produce art, how you think about it, how you do your job. And this intuition about the, the Catholicity of the faith was something that captured him even before he'd gone to seminary. And that's, uh, so there was even some kind of um, forecourt or porch to this different door into neo-Calvinism that reached him before he'd ever gone to seminary, but he didn't know that that's what the tradition was, but he, but he was influenced by it even back then. So I think that the big change between the Tim Keller of Center Church and the Tim Keller who later said that he was, quote, first a neo-Calvinist, that's absolutely not the difference between not neo-Calvinist and neo-Calvinist. Uh, in my view, it's the difference between implicit neo-Calvinist and explicit neo-Calvinist. Now, of course, when Tim eventually called himself first a neo-Calvinist, um, that, that remained neo-Calvinism on his own terms. Um, he still saw himself as much closer to Bavinck than to Kuiper. Um, and he spoke about that maybe in terms of temperament, um, but there was something, some kind of intuitions that he felt he was closer to Bavinck on than to Kuiper. And he still saw himself as more ecclesiological and more evangelistic than other American strands of explicit neo-Calvinism. But I think a huge factor in the last couple of decades of his life and his theological development was, and some of the other speakers have already mentioned this, it was the availability of English translations of neo-Calvinist texts by Herman Bavinck, J.H. Bavinck, Abraham Kuyper, which helped him, it helps him realize that the tradition that he was operating within was, down, um, was downstream from these sources that were now available to him. And then he realized that he can drink directly from the source. And when he did that, he found something that could hold together the commitments that he'd maintained for, uh, for many years before that. The commitments to being a revivalist and a pietist and an evangelist and a doctrinalist. So the self-identification at the end of, as a neo-Calvinist first uh, wasn't a rejection of those things either, but it was that through his engagement with neo-Calvinist sources directly, um, he thought that this tradition actually held those things together. So in that regard, I say this to close, um, this paper, this lecture has been on Tim's relationship to American neo-Calvinism. In that context, maybe his significance to American neo-Calvinism is that through him, this long stream of holistic implicit American neo-Calvinism has actually become explicit neo-Calvinism of its own sort. But I wonder if maybe here in Almeida in 2023, there's another significance of Tim Keller as an American neo-Calvinist, um, which is that we have a room full of Dutch Christians who resonate so strongly with Tim Keller, but the thing that Tim Keller resonated with was actually your own tradition, your own theologians, your own sources. So maybe it's not just a case of rethinking center church, but doing that maybe makes um, Dutch Christians rethink uh, Dutch, their, their own heritage. And I, if I can close with one idea from Tim that I think is really resonant here, uh, one of the things that Tim emphasized in, in, in preaching Christ to culture is um, finding, the, uh, finding sources, culturally respected sources, culturally important sources within that culture not always importing. Sometimes that's really important to do as well and very useful to bring in Christians from other contexts to help you, like a lens or a mirror to think about your culture. But for Tim, if you have these resources within your own culture and don't use them, that's a, that's a missed opportunity. So I think that's probably the alarm to tell me this is 40 minutes. My clock makes it 39 and 18 seconds. Dutch punctuality. But anyway, come on, best gedaan.
Dank je wel voor jullie geduld. En dag. Uh,